So FFV1, um, so at work we have a dedicated cluster designed for fuzzing. Uh, mainly that's used uh, for work stuff, uh, FMPEGs, HC64, MPEG2, uh, DC2, and we use a framework called UPipe to do something called framing, which is basically taking in a live feed and cutting it up into segments. Um, and so one day on a, on a Friday, I, the cluster is not used at the weekend, I just like, let's chuck some FFV1 in and see what happens. And then on Monday morning, I open it up, oh wow, okay, that's a lot of issues. And uh, ended up over, I think, the course of the week, reporting all these tickets. Uh, and they've all, they've all been fixed now, which is really good. So you now have a resilient decoder, an even more resilient decoder. So one thing I was kind of thinking I haven't quite talked about is, oh, maybe that's in the next slide, okay. Oh yes, so time to see some FFP1 doing fast. Um, let's see if there's another one. So that's, yeah. days ago on our little sort of test machine. It's not even production fuzzer. So it's an Intel NUC, it's about this big. Um, so you can see there that we've done 73 million different files have been created. So if you look at that, 73, 73 million different FFP1 files have been created. Um, it's run, and it's running quite quickly. Uh, so one of the problems that I'll talk about in a second is it's just, these are just random files I found on the internet, so I think off Peter's website maybe, but you need to find lots of small files. Uh, I've only got one, but that one file alone was able to find five crashes, so... Yes. That, so, yeah, I'll talk about in a sec. So, um, what are the problems of doing this? So there isn't a native FFP1 bitstream format, so it's not like... I believe it's only possible at least from a, a vampire point of view, to, to handle it in a container. So, but the fuzzer isn't aware of this difference. The fuzzer just decides to randomize data. So you can actually reach a stage where... Um, <coughs> so you can, the resiliency of the container could actually hide issues because the fuzzer just fuzz changes bytes and data randomly. And your, your decoder might say, ah, but there's an error in the container and not bother to decode any more corrupted data. So that's kind of one of the problems. Uh, with other codecs, we would usually fuzz without any container. So you would know, well, I'll talk about in a sec, but most of the time you would know that actually what you're expecting is happening. So in the beginning, we uh, used the fmpeg.c program. So that's just the main program, you type fmpeg, and you see lots of thousands and thousands of options. So this is far, far, far too complex for fuzzing. Um, it's a very, very complicated program. It's very, very difficult to understand what it's actually doing. Um, one, of, so one of the things FMPEG does that is the reason thing, things like VLC can play uh, lots of files is something called probing. So instead of actually trusting what's in the file, uh, what, the, what, what the container says it should be, it actually just tries to probe. One of the things, one of the big pitfalls with fuzzing, um, fuzzing a multimedia application of any sort with FMPEG is you may just be fuzzing program. So you may leave it and say, ah, oh, yeah, it's doing a great job. It's but I leave it for a week, and then, but actually, when you dig down, it's all it's doing is all fuzzing program. So all that's happening is it's saying, oh, is this a two six four file? Is this an AC three file? Is this whatever? But it's actually not doing any decoding or any anything of that sort. So you can actually spend a lot of time. One of my colleagues did this very recently. Um, thinking, ah, oh, yes, I've run it on a fuzz job and it's completely crash free. But when you actually look at it, it's not actually doing anything. It's just trying to guess what the file is for failing and then starting again. So, to solve this kind of, to, well, to improve the problem, we wrote the FF Fuzz program. So, it's a really, really simple program that's based off the examples. Um, talk a bit later. It also has some other advantages that we can. Um, you can res it can res it doesn't need to be respawned. Um, it uses a special property of AFL that within the same process you can it can be run multiple times. Whereas it, with FFM, you'll see it's far too complex to reset the state of that. Um, so we've not touched any 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 encoders I think apart from audio encoders uh, for fuzzing because the, the space of input video is so massive. Audio encoders are possible to fuzz, so you can take a wave file, probably a sine wave or something, distort it and 
I've seen all the encoders crash um, quite regularly. Actually, there was a jingle on some program at HBO Asia at about 8 o'clock every evening, and then it used to crash, um, it used to do a divide by zero. But I've not really seen anybody do anything with encoding, with buzzing uh, video encoders. That's a sort of interesting thing to look at. I'm not entirely sure what to do about that. So all of this isn't systematic at all. This is just kind of, um, I have some files somewhere that are small enough. I'm going to put them on the buzzer, run it over a week, a weekend, get on with my life, and then see what happens after that. It's not systematic. There isn't really an understanding of, OK, I've made this change. Now I should run this corpus on 10,000 files, find these issues. Ah, or I've made this change that I think is an improvement, but actually, it's actually broken. Well, my normal test suite was only there to say, am I still lossless? It's fine, but I may have broken resiliency. But you're not really, it's, there, it's not at all systematic, and there's not really an understanding of how changes affect the fuzzing process. And that really should be part of the test suite of some sort. But I think because of the time it takes to, to, to fuzz large data sets, this hasn't really happened yet. So obviously, what you do when you when you have a face with a complex problem, you get an intern to fix it, and this is what we're doing. So getting a summer intern, maybe a very late summer intern in about two weeks, and his job will be to try and make this systematic. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is kind of so the, the the point of well, one of the sort of demands of buzzing is the files need to be small, so 100 kilobytes or so. Um, and we don't really have a good test corpus FFP1 stuff. We just certainly when I even even with um, the, the H.264 uh, MP2 stuff, we do at work. Uh, it's just random files that we have, and we just stick them in and see what happens. But we don't really have a big corpus of here is I don't know um, an HD one, an SD one, testing this feature, testing this feature, testing this. We don't. They're just random files that we happen to find and. Um, and so we don't really have that as a, as, a, as a test corpus, but it would be really nice just to have a standard corpus um, of, of data and just say, I'm going to fuzz this stuff, and then every week or something to see what would happen as we make changes. FP1, to be fair, the FP1 decoder doesn't change much. Uh, I haven't talked about it, but probably this is something that should be done for Matroska. I think that's much harder because the kind of almost by definition of the container is relatively thin layer, so you'd have to be able to sort of figure out how you, the fuzzer would only be able to modify the container and not any of the payload data. Or would it even matter? Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the challenges. So hopefully my intern will build a test corpus of lots of little files, lots of little codecs, and we can actually, like we, well, like we do with normal test readings, so taking data, making sure it's lossless, or making sure it's decoded as expected. We should do that for fuzzing, so. FFP1 doesn't move much, but for various reasons that I can discuss later, 264 and MPEG2 change a lot. Uh, this is kind of the bend of my life, but nothing much. So there's, yes, uh, for extra credit, there is a lot of further reading. Um, yeah, I maybe should have made some tiny URLs, but it's actually, but anyway. Uh, you can see them later. You can, I'll put these slides up somewhere, any three of them. Uh, then if anyone had any questions, thanks for waving. I mean, you demonstrated how uh, in in fuzzing, uh, you ca you came up with recommendations and uh, on how the decoder itself should be changed. But I mean, from the from the testing, do you have any conclusions on how the specification should be changed? No, these were I don't know. That's the question. So these these issues. Let's see if we can check on one. Let's look at that one, for example. Uh, so that was, I don't know what it was. So that was some kind of condition where they didn't expect that branch to happen. Um, so that, that, that these are all implementation related. I'm, I'm not sure, so, I mean, certainly you're in this, so you're probably in an interesting position because you, so you're actually able to define the specification, whereas most of the fuzzing people do, it's already on things that are there. Uh, so I've not really thought about that. That's actually an interesting question. Um, can you build resiliency into your... I'll follow up. That's an interesting question. No, and I'm not sure which one is 
better of AFL and the, and the um, LVM. There's lots of, I didn't go, could have gone into it in way more detail, but there's lots of different things, lots of different combinations of things you can do. Um, and there's address sanitizer, which I have not got to use. I use the, I use the LLVM AFL fast mode, but then you could also do uh, a stress sanitizer on that, which is I've never managed to, do, to get working, but I believe it's possible. Yeah, I, when I was touching with them, I found LLVM further to be after the instrumentation for A10 and the end and the end. Okay. Yeah, oh, that's an, yeah, an intern thing to be honest. Yeah. 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 That's good to know.